you want to take an ideal gas, air, at this pressure and deliver it at that pressure, that's the real goal. And you're coming in with the fixed temperature, T1, and you're going to go out with another temperature, T2. Why is it cost effective to introduce an intercooler whose job is to uh, uh, reject some heat from the air halfway in the process? So let's say you're at this intermediate pressure. They use the letter C and D in the textbook, but uh, you, you have a first compressor, maybe it takes it half the way, and then the second compressor takes it the rest of the pressure increase. Why is it good to have an intercooler? And so we started that discussion. The way I wanted to attack it was to talk about pumps, because I think you have dealt with pumps, have some experience with pumps, and know how to analyze pumps, see how much they cost. And so we talked about the minimum theoretical work to adiabatically uh, operate a pump where it takes 300 Kelvin water at 100 kilopascal and delivers it at whatever temperature it's coming out at, at 1100 kilopascal. Did we not talk through this one last time? And we said, oh, we've analyzed that. It's the integral V dP. The specific volume for liquid is constant, comes outside. You just have V times delta P. It comes in at one kilojoule per kilogram. We then changed it a little bit. Only one word changed, isothermal instead of adiabatic. It's still the minimum theoretical work, meaning there are no irreversibilities. Did it really change our estimate? No, because the T2 out from the pump is essentially the same as T1. It's a, a half a degree higher, 0.3 degrees C higher. And so to cool it a little bit is not going to reduce the work for the pump. It still costs about one kilojoule of energy per kilogram of water flow through the pump. Then we shifted. We shifted and said, don't pump water, compress air. And you can say a pump, compressor, well, that's the difference between a pump. Pumps for water, compressors are for gases. So here what we're going to do is we're going to compress air, the same pressure change. So we're going to go from 100 to 1100 kilopascal. It's the minimum theoretical work required, and we're going to adiabatically compress it. How far did we make it through that? Did we get a number for that one? All right, do you remember the number? Yeah, about 290, it's about 300. So it's around 297 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so what, what do we have is we have a compressor, and we have the inlet and the outlet. So you're coming in at T1, P1, you're going out at T2, P2. You do a control volume around that compressor, and then you do a first law analysis. The first law for a adiabatic, we, you know, the fluid's adiabatically compressed. So what's that say about the heat transfer? It's negligible. It's well insulated. So when you have the first law, it's like zero is equal to Q in minus work plus the H in minus H out. Neglect changes kinetic potential energy. If it's well insulated, we find that the work is the H in minus the H out. Constant specific heats. C sub P, T1 minus T2. <coughs> T2 is going to be higher, and that will give a negative work, indicating, yes, it's not work out of the compressor, but work in. Now, how do we find this T2? From a second law analysis, we found that uh, T2 is equal to T1 times the P2 over P1 raised to the K minus 1 over K. Where would that come from? Ideal gas undergoing an isentropic, S equal to a constant, compression process with constant specific heats. C is equal to a constant, like C sub P, or a lot of times we'll write K as a constant. Okay, so we can substitute right there, and you get that this is C sub P times T1 times 1 minus P2 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K. You want to get rid of the negative sign, like I did here. I know that it's, I know which direction there's energy transfer. 
but the units and the magnitude are 297 kilojoules per kilogram. Make sense? The next one, which is the same pressure change, it's still the minimum theoretical work that we're looking for, but what, what word is changed? It's not adiabatic, it's isothermal. Did we do this one? Yes. We did. All right. So what did it come out to be? 206. And so right away what you find is that if you can, it, the difference between 297 and 206, that's like 91 kilojoules per kilogram. That's significant. It's not insignificant. It's a big deal. And now you say, well, why is why is there almost a hundred kilojoule per kilogram difference? Why is it less expensive to compress it isothermally than adiabatically? And somebody may be tempted to say something, well, well, it's not going to be reversible. No, both cases had the minimum theoretical work. When you see that minimum theoretical work, what is sigma dot per m dot equal to? Zero. No entropy generation no, due to irreversibilities. All right. So this is a significant difference. Why? Why? Why is it different? Why is it lower when it's isothermal? And you can go back and see this on a, a, the analysis. Let me come and do it this way. I pointed back to the end of chapter 6, did I not? And there's this equation right here. Have you seen that equation? Here it is typed out. And so this is my work per unit mass flowing through an open system through a control volume like a compressor, a pump. If it's internally reversible, what's that mean? Sigma dot zero. This is a combination of first law and the second law. You can see that in the derivation that I outlined here. Often the changes in the kinetic energy and changes in potential energy are negligible and we're left with this minus VDP. And then if you put on a plot, pressure volume plot, and you think about going from a low pressure P1 to a high pressure P2, you start with a large specific volume and you're going to be compressing it. If you compress it, uh, you're going to this new pressure line here. If you compress it internally reversible and adiabatic, it's isentropic, and that would be along a line of PV to the K is equal to a constant. That describes that curve. PV to the K is a constant. We said from this equation, the integral PDV is the rep visually represented by the area not under the curve, but to the left of the curve, going toward the axis that you're integrating with respect to. This is the stuff they don't show you in calculus. In calculus, they just have, you always integrate F dx, where x is the horizontal axis. And you always go from a lower x1 to a greater x2. And then in engineering, oh no, sometimes we can integrate backwards on the x-axis. And here, sometimes we can integrate like on the y-axis. Because P is the pressure on the y-axis. Well, if you integrate where you're doing it isothermally, what you have is a curve that looks like this. You still take it up to that same pressure. But that curve is just PV is a constant. How did that come about? Why, do you, why is that true? It's PV is equal to a constant. Well, is it always an ideal gas? Does it always obey that equation? Yes. And if temperature is constant during the compression, what is T times R? A constant. Hence, PV to the 1 power is equal to a constant. And the, air, the work required will be given by this area visually. And so what's the difference? The difference is this area and that's the energy saved. So in terms of the numbers that we just ran, the first area is around 300. The next area is around 210. 
And the difference we calculated to be 91 looks is around 90. And that's the visual image of the savings, the work saved, because you compressed it isothermally. You kept it. Uh, as soon as you started to compress, there would had to be some heat transfer out of the air to keep it at the same temperature. All right. Another way to think of it is, is when you're compressing something, it's good if that specific volume is small. And think about it, while you're compressing, maybe we started out here where the specific volume of air is around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, depending on your temperature and pressure. Think about for water, what was our specific volume? 0 0.001. Try and put that on the same axis. It's like one thousandth. And so for water, it's like this, and the area is just that. So visually, you can try and put them all on the same plot. This has one kilojoule per kilogram. That original red was, what, 296, almost 300 kilojoules per kilogram, a lot larger, 300 times larger. And then uh, the, um, what did I call it, purple, if you do isothermal compression of the air, it um, is a lot less, and the savings is uh, the blue around 91. All right. So you can just take this relationship from PV to the K, stick it in, do the calculus, the integration, and come up with this relationship right here. It looks a little different than the relationship that I derived, but they're the same. Uh, basically, this term right in here is simply C sub P. Here, let's show that. Let's start it off and say, well, K over K minus 1 times R is K t uh, over K minus 1 times R. R. Okay, well, what is K? Isn't that C sub P divided by C sub V? C sub P divided by C sub V. So I substituted for both of those Ks, and instead of 1, I put C sub V over C sub V, right? And can you see that everything's over C sub V? So let's get rid of that. And then we remember, so there's two things that we've used for one thing already, is that we recall K is equal to C sub P over C sub V. The next thing is, is R is C sub P minus C sub E. Is that true? It is definitely true. And guess what R can be canceled with? And so there you go. <laughs> uh, this uh, K times R divided by K minus 1 is equal to C sub P. All right. Uh, likewise, you can do the integration and end up with that R T1 natural log of P2 over P1. I strongly encourage everybody in here to be thinking about taking the fundamentals of engineering exam. Is that on your horizon? Your last semester as a student in an ABED accredited engineering program, you should take the fundamentals of engineering exam. Yes, your last semester is busy. Fit it in. It's important. Oh, I'll take it when my life is not so busy. Your life is just only going to get worse. <laughs> when you take that first job, guess what? You don't have that much free time. So you will want to become a PE. You will want to become a PE. You, you're doing all this work. Take the FE, start the process. Okay. In the book, they made it now. It's a PDF version, but... Uh, they used to have paper copies, but anyway, this is copied and pasted out of the PDF version. If you take a look at the uh, thermodynamic section, they talk about open thermodynamic systems. They talk about this equation right here. That's reversible flow work. Do you recognize that equation? Yeah. And then they said, hey, special cases for an open system where you have this reversible flow work where the constant specific volume, recognize that? Negligible, yeah. This one's kind of silly. I don't know why they put it in there, but hey, constant pressure, no work, right? 
this is we never even emphasize it but what did we just cover ideal gas where PV is equal to a constant that's isothermal constant temperature right here is the same equation notice that they're going to give a negative sign this is this is going to be negative because of the P1 is lower than P2 all right and then here the next case isentropic ideal gas PV to the K is equal to a constant yeah, we just talked about it. And then they do the integration, and here's their final conclusion. That's the same equation we're just looking at. So when you study or do a little review for the FE exam, you'll flip through the handbook. They give this to you. It's available on the computer. It's all a computer-based exam. You'll have that PDF file. You'll be able to flip through it electronically, and you will recognize the equations that are in your engineering curriculum. There'll be a whole section in solid mechanics and materials and controls and thermodynamics and heat transfer and fluid mechanics. All right? Very good.